I'm just going to start by saying that I've modified slightly what I'm going to discuss today. So I'm focusing on discussing strategies and approaches to analyzing film. And originally at the end, I was going to talk about issues in higher education at the moment regarding decolonizing, decentering and diversifying the curriculum. And when it came to the run throughs of this, I was really pushing the time limit. And this second area is such an important area. I didn't want to squeeze it in to a rushed five minutes. It very much merits its own talk. And of course, I'd be delighted to join you again at a later date for that. So with that point in mind, the, as I say, the main focus of my talk here this evening with you is, as the title indicates, working with film and how to support students' critical and analytical engagement with the medium. I'll start by briefly setting the scene in terms of the opportunities and challenges of teaching film before focusing on different analytical strategies that we can employ. And I'll give some resources at the end of ways in which you can continue this work on the development of film analysis skills. And at this point, I'd like to stress that I teach film primarily within German departments, as well as in film departments, and I teach it to students with and without a film studies background. I work a lot with first year groups, and for that reason, I hope that much of what I'll talk about today will be of relevance to you and your teaching. By extension, I obviously don't teach post 16 level and there might be parts of what I say that don't entirely align with the needs, requirements or realities of your teaching and your students experience and I fully defer to your specialist knowledge in these fields. If something isn't helpful or doesn't apply obviously just discard it. And I should also add here, I research and teach film professionally. And when I talk about specific examples from films, please don't think I would never have spotted that. Firstly, I've taught these films for a number of years and read around them. And secondly, as is the very nature of these things, I've deliberately selected examples that are rich for analysis. There are numerous other shots, sequences and scenes that wouldn't allow for such a rich discussion. As I said, I work primarily in German film. That wasn't always the case, though. My BA was quite a traditional program with primarily literature. I think I did one purely film module as an undergraduate and one module that included film. My master's was in film and my PhD was in German film, so fusing the two disciplines. And I mention this purely to stress that we can all have concerns about our ability to analyze a medium that we might not have encountered much or even at all during our studies, but this really shouldn't hold us back. We have applicable transferable skills from different disciplines that are really, really applicable to approaching film as well. And like many things, it's a matter of growing in confidence, um, trying out analysis and the more that we do so the more confident and adept we become in our skill set and analysis thereof. So what I'll do today is talk about some of the starting points or springboards that we can use for analysing film. I've shaped my talk around the A-level German set film uh, list and I'd openly and clearly like to acknowledge that I'm fully aware there might well be people with us this evening teaching other qualifications. Focusing on the A-level is practically helpful today because of the set list of films. And I hope this might create some form of common currency when showing examples. And to return to a previous point, you're the experts in secondary education and you know the requirements of your respective boards. So why film? There's little doubt that film is an engaging, attractive medium, especially for students, at least in terms of engaging with the story and the ideas, it is accessible and generally students do respond well to it. Film, especially the examples on the A-level AQA set list interweaves multiple aspects. There's the engaging plot, there's the formal devices, so the filmmaking strategies. Often there's a socio-historical or socio-political context, both in terms of the plot and at the time the film was made. So for example, with Goodbye Lenin, we have a film that explores the events of 1989 and 1990, but from the vantage point of 2003. 
So when approaching this film, we can also consider why this perspective was adopted at this point in German culture and how debates at the time might have informed both what we see and how we see it on screen. Also, films might seek to challenge dominant positions in terms of dominant representations on screen or dominant narratives. And these are all aspects that we can pull out of film analysis. Now, when analyzing a literary text, we can use specific quotations as a way of demonstrating analytical depth. Obviously, in film, we don't have this. But our equivalent in film is, generally speaking, specific scenes and then even specific aspects within specific scenes. For example, there might be something significant about the character, about what we see or hear. In an exam or oral, we also don't have the luxury of screenshots, so we do have to set the scene, so to speak, when introducing what we're talking about. But and this is an absolutely crucial point, if we only ever paraphrase the plot, then we don't get the analytical depth that we do need to engage and analyze the formal devices used. In this regard, a helpful starting point, I think, is to consider the framework given by AQA in regards to how they want film to be used. And to read from the text on screen, all questions will require a critical appreciation of the concepts and issues covered in the work and a critical and analytical response to features such as the form and the technique of presentation as appropriate to the work studied. And we can start by breaking this down into three areas. Firstly, there's the what. So what is happening in the film or scene? What are the concepts and issues at stake? Then there's the question of how. So the form and techniques employed, the filmmaking strategies. And then finally, there's the issue of, of why. So why is this significant? That's to say, en engaging with the students' critical and analytical responses to the film. And we can use this what, how, why approach as a framework for analyzing film. And with these three boxes, the next box is slightly more important than the previous one. So the what is obviously important. If we don't pick a relevant theme or idea, we're not going to get very far. But stating that theme X is present in scene Y on its own also won't get us very far. At, for that reason, we have to move on to the how, and the how in that sense is more important than the what of unpacking the strategies used to convey the themes and ideas on screen. But at the same time, we can do a wonderful close scene analysis, but if we don't then reflect on the significance of this, why it's important, we also won't achieve full critical depth. So I think it'd be helpful to go through these three ideas in more detail, starting with the what. And again, this is a model I use with my students. If it's not fully applicable to your situation or your teaching, please take what's useful and discard what isn't. So the, the what is about setting the scene. And this means identifying the core theme or ideas that we're writing about, or in the case of the oral discussing. Where we only have limited words, we really need this scene setting to be targeted and focused. We don't want a mini synopsis of the film to be the main body of our discussion. And there are two main reasons for this. The first is we need to know what the focus of the subsequent analysis will be. This little point, for example, discussing the significance of the SED party in the GDR or the fall of the Berlin Wall, if we're then going to be focusing on a scene depicting the Stasi in Das Leben der Anderen. So the points that we pull out when setting the scene, where that emphasis lies, should anticipate what our analysis is going to be. Yes, it's relevant that the film is set in the GDR. Yes, the Stasi is relevant but providing an overview of the political leadership of the GDR probably isn't. And the second reason is, as silly as this might sound, we do want to demonstrate that we've actually watched the film. If we're too broad, we could arguably apply a number of our points to different films. So if the focus of a response to Goodbye Lenin was Goodbye Lenin is a film set in the final years of the GDR, and that was pretty much it, 
well, arguably some of that could apply to Das Leben der Anderen as well, as well as countless other films. But if we fine tune that statement to Goodbye Lenin is a film set in the final years of the GDR, which examines the impact of reunification through the prism of a family, then we're already being more targeted in our focus. And then the expectation, expectation would be that whatever aspects we choose to focus on and analyze would be linked to the hook at that end of that statement. So here, the prism of the family. And we could just as easily choose to focus on the impact of everyday life or the ways in which East Germans had to reorientate themselves following the fall of the wall, to name but a few. And in this way, we move from the general to the specific. So next up is how. Um, how is the what shown on screen, so to speak? How are the core ideas and themes that we've identified conveyed using filmmaking techniques on screen? And this requires us to focus on the filmmaking techniques, the formal devices at stake. And at this point, we're gonna step away from that diagram for a moment and explore the different aspects of the film analysis techniques in more detail. And I'd like to start with some points of departure. So a common concern is, but is it relevant? Or am I reading too much into this? And the answer here is almost always, yes, it is relevant and no, you're not. But we do have to make a link. So remember, if we're building on our what, the theme or idea that we've identified, we need to link that to the points that we're analyzing. Our aim with film analysis is to reveal new layers of meaning. So if we can make a connection between the way that something is depicted on screen and the core themes at stake, then it's absolutely relevant. Now, just because it's relevant doesn't always mean it's intentional. Usually it will have been. Films are expensive to make and experts are involved at every level of setting up a scene. So especially when it comes to props, motifs and camera angles, it's highly likely to have been intentional. But this doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't talk about the implications arising from other aspects. In fact, I actually caution people against speculating what a director might or might not have intended. It's hard to prove and actually it's not that helpful. And just because the director understands the film in one way doesn't mean it's the only reading possible. So instead, I always recommend to keep the focus on the film and the meanings it creates and that open up as a result of the analysis. So instead of stating what a director does or wants or thinks, we keep the focus on the scene and the readings and interpretations that emerge. Similarly, I encourage people to avoid speculating on what audiences might have thought. Audiences are notoriously unreliable and rarely respond in the way that they're expected to do so. So I thought we could look at some concrete examples from films. And before we do this, I want to stress that the list that I've got on screen and show shortly isn't exhaustive and that it's also what I call a toolkit, not a shopping list. And by that, I mean that of the different aspects we can analyze, we pick the ones that are most relevant to the scene or sequence or shot in question. We don't need to tick them all off. So if lighting or sound isn't relevant to a specific aspect, there's no need to cover it just for the sake of covering it. I thought we could look at five aspects this evening um, and I've grouped them as follows. Firstly, in terms of what we can see. So the mise-en-scene. Uh, this covers everything from props to costumes to makeup to where things and people are positioned in the frame on the camera. Secondly, related to that, where is the camera? So the shot types and the camera angles being used. Then how the shots are put together, so the editing of the film. A quick word about music, and we'll talk about diegetic and non-diegetic sound, and then symbolism, so whether anything looks familiar in the film. And then I'm just going to jump ahead slightly to that third box we had on the diagram, because we need to remember that when we're considering these formal aspects, we always need to have in the back of our head that why question. So why is this significant? Or as I sometimes like to call it, the so what question. It's a close up shot is used. Okay, so what? What effect is created as a result? 
So let's look at some concrete examples. And the first example I've picked is from Das Leben der Anderen. All the examples that I'll use this evening are from the list of films on the AQA list. So at least hopefully one of the films will be familiar to you. And I want to repeat the point I made earlier as well, that I've picked shots that are particularly rich. So please don't think, how am I ever supposed to spot that? Today, I hope is about introducing what to look out for so that hopefully you can go away and continue to apply these ideas to your own teaching practice and the film or films of study. So starting with the mise-en-scene, as I said, mise-en-scene essentially refers to everything that we can see on screen. So props, color schemes, characters, clothing, makeup and lighting, as well as where things are positioned and placed on screen. There's often overlap here as well. In fact, we'll look at an example where this happens. So it might be that the mise-en-scene and the camera angles are directly intertwined. Our first screenshots, as I said, are from Das Leben der Anderen. And on the left, we have the opening shot of the film. The start of films and or the first time we meet characters are often deeply significant as these create expectations, expectations that might serve as the basis for the film and be built on and expanded on, or expectations that are then subverted or undermined over the course of the film. Starting with who we can see then, we have the guard and the prisoner. They've both got their backs to the camera, creating a sense of anonymity. But this sense of anonymity doesn't function the same for both characters. Looking at the guard, we can see from the body language that the anonymity almost acts as a protection and also a status of power. Whereas the prisoner with his head facing downwards and the guard's hand on his arm isn't in control of his own physical movements. For him, anonymity is a way of victimizing him and removing his sense of self. If you also look at the colors that are evident in this opening shot, not only are the grays and yellows lacking in color, but the clothes of the guard and the prisoner very much merge into the surroundings. There's a sense of the oppression of the very space that they're in, that they can't be divided from the context of this prison. In fact, the only colour we get in this shot, as you might see on the left wall, there are two small red lights, red lights being the sign of, of danger or again of control in this space. The prisoners then brought into the interrogation room with Wiesler, and this is a shot on the right hand side, we see his face for the first time, but if you know the film you might remember that he's then referred to as his prisoner number, so again a anonymizing strategy, he's not given a name, his sense of identity isn't acknowledged. Wiesler tells him to sit down with Setzensisch, an imperative, again, an order and a command. Power relations are really coming out in these very opening moments of the scene. Wiesler, as we can see from the left hand side there, is placed with his back to camera and the prisoner is forced to face this figure of power. And if we look at what's behind the prisoner, or at least what will be when he sits in that chair, well, we have a portrait on the wall of Eric Honecker, the first secretary of the GDR. So in front of him is a figure of power, control and surveillance with the Stasi officer behind him as well, a representative or an image of state power. As you said, his clothing blends into the environment, all contributes to this sense of power, control and victimization in this opening sequence. With a complete tonal shift, um, looking at an example from Goodbye Lenin, uh, we can apply similar strategies with the Mies on Sen. Now, a common criticism leveled at Goodbye Lenin is that it engages in unreflective celebrations of ostalgie, by which we mean it celebrates products of East German life, but doesn't really have a space for more critical, more nuanced engagements, that everything is surface level in this film. We can see from these shots, there's certainly an image on the products, in particular the foodstuffs from the GDR. I said that we often get multiple aspects of 
filmmaking techniques in play together. And we see this here that we have a close up shot of Alex holding a jar of gherkins and the close up shot then directs our attention to it and su suggests that it's significant. Now, close ups, because they create the sense of immediacy and significance, they tend to be used for significant people or events, not for jars of gherkins. And this seems to feed into the sense that we're supposed to enjoy what we can see on screen and that it's quite lighthearted in its engagement with the German past. But is this the only reading? Certainly in the right hand image as well, we get another focus on the products as Alex is transferring the Western goods into the Eastern packaging. But is another reading possible here if we look at how the scenes are constructed? Well, let's go back to that image on the left, first of all. The close-up shot, yes, seems to celebrate the product, but it also shows all the nuanced detail as well. It shows the label. It shows the brand on the label, Kuna, a West German brand. And the label also tells us it's Moscow Gherkins Russian style. And there's a double irony here. Firstly, a West German company is now selling Soviet or, or Russian produce, and not just that, but to an East German customer base. And secondly, Alex can't actually find the original East German gherkins in the supermarket. He has to buy an equivalent and one sold by a Western company. So we can see the capitalization of not just the GDR, but also of its very consumer products. And then there's a second point to consider as well. The idea of that second shot on the right is that Alex is maintaining a lie that the GDR exists in order to protect and shield his mother from the truth. And he does this by presenting the mother with foodstuffs that he pretends are original GDR products, but as I say, are actually from the West. And two possible readings emerge here. These two readings are united by one common theme, namely that the mother doesn't seem to realize that she's eating Western products. So what do we conclude here? It could be that there's actually no conceivable or noticeable difference between East and West products, that despite the claims of superiority of Western choice, in reality, they taste the same. Or there could be another reading that East Germany or the GDR is symbolized here through jars and packaging is essentially just that now. They're empty containers, they're empty products. The content, the value is West German. And we'll often find that these multiple readings are possible. And that's in part what I mean by revealing layers of meaning that there's often more than one possible conclusion that can be drawn and what see, might seem like a straightforward shot or scene often becomes far more complicated when we start to reflect on these individual filmmaking choices behind them. And to take another example from Goodbye Lenin, sometimes we get a mismatch in terms of what we see and hear in terms of the dialogue. And we see this in this scene here, Alex's voiceover, talks about a sense of frustration in his personal life that he felt, he says with a sense of irony, that he was at the height of his masculine allure, he's utterly fed up in his private life. But behind him, we have the buildings, typically East German Plattenbau buildings, draped with German flags. We have a mismatch between the celebrations on a national political level and in reality, how things were going in Alex's private life. And this mismatch is humorous, but it also alerts us to another point, that in this film, national events, the events that make TV and that make history records, are playing out in the background, and that the film is actually more interested in the personal. The national as well, and national and the personal, might not always align exactly in this film. And a few more examples of mise-en-scene because it's such a broad area. Um, in the screenshots for Das Leben der Anderen, we looked briefly at space in the film. We can apply this to Lola Rent as well. If we think in Lola Rent about the types of space most commonly associated with our two main characters, Lola and Manny, 
we can ask ourselves, where do each of these characters spend the majority of the film? Now, spatially, Manny is overwhelmingly in the film associated with the telephone box and the supermarket. So enclosed spaces. And there are two points we can pull out here. One is that enclosed spaces, especially the telephone box, convey a sense of entrapment. And secondly, if you think about the spaces associated with Lola, she is overwhelming the scene running in the streets of Berlin, in public spaces, outdoor spaces. Traditionally and conventionally in film, women have been associated with indoor spaces, whereas public spaces are traditionally associated with male characters, this being designed to reflect the different social status attached to gender. But in Lola Rent, this is flipped on its head. It's Lola who is the visible character, who is associated with the outdoors and who can navigate public space. And it's Lola who saves the day, not Manny, the traditional male hero. And we can also consider lighting in terms of the mise-en-scene. So this is illustrated particularly well with an example from Sophie Scholl, die letzten Tage. Throughout the film with Sophie Scholl, Sophie is associated with light. Even when she's imprisoned, natural light comes through the window. And we need to reflect on why this might be significant. So symbolically, what is the significance of bathing her in light? What are the connotations of a character associated with light? And how does this relate to what we know about Sophie's religious beliefs? In short, how is light used metaphorically in the film? And to this, we can add the fact that Sophie's interrogator, Robert Moore, is overwhelmingly associated with darker spaces and he never fully emerges from these darker spaces. Sometimes in films, we do see characters who are associated with darker spaces at the start of the film and who move into spaces associated with light. And this in itself is supposed to reflect a moral change in the character, but in our film, no such complete change takes place. And the final point on mise en scène and to return to goodbye Lenin again, we can indeed generally should apply these analytical tools, not just to single shots, but indeed to sequences. For example, if we take a sequence in which Alex's mother leaves the apartment for the first time without Alex's knowledge, we can see a number of interesting points all come together. We see her disorientated on the street. A trabant drives past, Trabant being the East German cars, a symbol of familiarity, we'd think, but it does so at great speed and serves to create a disorientating effect and is quickly followed by Western cars as well. The mother then turns round to try to find her bearings and we see advertising boards behind her and one word briefly sticks out, and this is the image in the middle, the word East. So firstly, this word East and marker is no longer associated with the GDR in this context, but with Western capitalism because it's selling Western products. And secondly, the word is in English, obviously. The sign of Western influence that just a few months earlier would have been unthinkable is already changing the street landscape of Eastern Berlin. And then finally, this idea of rapid change is also carried out in the way that the scene closes. This is a sequence in which the helicopter carries the statue of Lenin through the streets of East Berlin. And at one point, the extended hand of the Lenin statue seems to be reaching towards the mother. Is this a symbol of familiarity, of affinity between them? Certainly, it can be read like that. But then when we look at the closing moments of the sequence, another reading potentially emerges because the statue is carried off into the sunset. And not only is it carried off into the sunset, the sense that it, its time is now ending, but markers of East Berlin, particularly its architectural markers, signs that would have been visible as situating us in the GDR, such as the TV tower, are pushed to the edge of the frame. They're no longer the central focus of the shot. So moving on to how we can look at camera angles and shot types. We're going to go back to Das Leben der Anderen because the camera angles here are particularly significant and allow for lots of discussion. 
When we see Wiesler, the camera is tilted slightly upwards. If you see, it's not a straight line when we look at him, but rather we, the audience, are looking up towards him. So first question would be, what's the effect of doing this and why might it be significant given the ideas in the scene being explored? Now, sometimes, and I should say by no means always, but sometimes close up shots and long shots can be used for deliberate effect to create additional meaning. Close up shots being where we see the character's full face on screen, or in the case of Goodbye Lenin, we had a product as well. And this can be a really effective way of creating affinity between the character and the audience because we see the emotion playing out on the character's face. There's another use of close ups as well, or in the case of the image we've got on the left, we could probably say it's a medium close up rather than a close up. And this is a way of showing power relations on screen, particularly when the use of a close up or a medium close up is then quite quickly contrasted with a character shown in a long shot or a medium long shot if it's a little bit closer. So I'll unpack what I mean by this. If you look at the image of Wiesler, you'll see that his body takes up a significant amount of space on screen. It largely dominates the screen in terms of the objects we can see. And this can be used to convey power. This is particularly evident when we look at the image on the right, where we see how the prisoner is shown on screen, because by contrast, his body takes up only a very small amount of the image. He is engulfed by space. He seems to have um, little sense of authority in this scene. So here we have an example of shot types and camera angles being used to reinforce the message of who has the power in the screen. One character dominates the space, the other is being dominated by the space. And another example of this is from a film I haven't talked about yet, Almania Willkommen in Deutschland. And here we can see the camera angle and the shot and the mise-en-scene all working together to create a specific effect. Our attention is immediately drawn to the huge Coca-Cola bottle on screen. It dominates the frame and draws our attention to it just as it does to the character on the ground who is utterly dwarfed by it. In fact, the whole layout of the supermarket is like a shrine to consumerism. He's looking up at this item that's bathed in light. The use of a long shot as well, again, where the character's body appears small on screen, really marks out just how vulnerable in a way this character is and overwhelmed by the surroundings he's in. He's out of place in this setting and completely enthralled to the items around him. And I mentioned as well the lighting. The lighting is significant in this scene and the top of the bottle is bathed in light. But look at where that light's coming from. It's no coincidence that light fittings are so prominent in this shot because that sense of light and the quasi-religious connotations is actually coming from artificial light, the lights hanging in the shot. Again, pointing to this sense of consumerism and artificiality that's at play in this shot. It's not just the individual shots and camera angles that we can consider, but also how these are then put together. Now, it's not the easiest point to illustrate editing with screenshots, so I'm going to move on fairly quickly here, but I'll talk about some aspects that we can consider. So, Do we have fast paced or slow editing? Are there lots of rapid cuts where the camera angles change? And what's the effect of this? So in Lola Rend, for example, we often have rapid, rapid editing and cuts. If we think about the moments where we have the flash forwards in people's lives, these are edited as a series of rapid shots. And there's also a pulsating soundtrack in the background. And all of this contributes to the fast paced and frantic action of Lola's run. By contrast, sometimes editing can be deliberately slow when we get long sequences and long takes. This also conveys a sense of time, but often, and again, not always, but often, if there are no cuts, it's intended to give a sense of slowness. 
long shots and slow editing can also be used to recreate the sense of staring voyeurism and it feels like we can be looking at a character often for an uncomfortably long length of time like we're intruding or staring at someone and this is a strategy that's often used in films dealing with the Stasi for example to recreate that sense of uncomfortable voyeurism and the final aspect that we could consider here is whose perspective is the sequence shown from. Point of view shots can be particularly relevant because it fuses our perspective, the audience, with that of a character. And again, it's important to reflect why a point of view shot might be used at a given time and what the implications are of fusing us, the audience, with a particular character. Sometimes as well in terms of editing or how shots are being put together, we can consider the film more broadly and not just an individual scene or sequence because shot composition, so how the scene is set up or how the shot is set up can be repeated across a film. And again, we've got a really good example of this from Das Leben der Anderen. And we'll start with our now familiar screenshot from Das Leben der Anderen. We've talked about how power is conveyed in this shot and how the prisoner is in a position of weakness and that we have the more dominant Wiesler wearing his office, officer's uniform and taking up more space on screen. Now, interestingly, this shot composition appears on two more occasions in the film. And look at where and how it appears. So we see a very similar shot composition at the point at which Rubnitz brings in Wiesler to question his loyalty and his actions. By this point, Wiesler is already starting to experience doubts about the mission he's undertaking. And it's now Wiesler who is in the position of the person being interrogated. He's still in a form of his uniform, but he's the one that's beginning to be engulfed by the space and merge into the color scheme around him. He is literally and figuratively on the other side of the desk. And then we get a very similar scene again towards the end of the film. And in this scene, Wiesler is now the one interrogating again, this time Maria Christa, but he's no longer in uniform and he's shot using the long shot. The type of shot and framing which in this film has been used as a way of conveying a lack of power or vulnerability. So here we can see how the cinematography, the way that the scene is set up, mirrors Wiesler's transformation in terms of the plot. Another aspect that's particularly hard to demonstrate using screenshots is the use of sound. So again, I won't linger too long on this either. But to say, in essence, there are two ways in which sound can be used in film, or at least presented. And these are termed diegetic and non-diegetic. Sometimes non-diegetic is referred to as extra diegetic as well. Diegetic sound is basically anything the characters can hear and sound that's captured at the same time as the image. So if a character turns on the radio, we hear what they hear, that's diegetic sound. If a, camera, if a character opens a window and there's a sound of traffic and we hear that too, it's diegetic sound, or if there's bird song and so forth. Non-diegetic sound is essentially everything that's added later on, and this is generally a soundtrack. Again, identifying a song or a particular sound is in itself not particularly relevant unless we then reflect on the implications of using a sound or a song. For example, is the character listening to a particular genre of music or a piece of band music? Does what we hear correspond to what we see? In the case of Lola Rent, as I say, we hear a pulsating soundtrack which complements Lola's run. But sometimes there might be a misalignment, especially if a piece of music or a song is used with lyrics. It's always worth listening or reflecting on what the lyrics are and whether this matches what we're seeing on screen or whether there's an ironic divide between the two. And then the final aspect that we could consider is symbolism. And this is a fairly broad area. Essentially by this, I mean, do any objects, features, ideas convey additional meanings either within the film itself or from our knowledge from without the film? In this regard, props, colors and locations are particularly significant. 
In Sophie Scholl, for instance, Sophie is marked out by virtue of her red cardigan. The rest of the colour palette used in the film is largely pale blue, pale green, grey, brown and so forth, not particularly striking colours. Likewise, more her interrogator suit is and the setting is unremarkable. But what is striking is that his bow tie is red and not just is it red, but it's the same shade of red as Sophie's cardigan. So what kind of link or point of contrast is being suggested here? What's the implication of using these two colors between these two figures? Is it designed to suggest a link or is it a point of contrast? Certainly in the courtroom, the colour red appears here starkly as well in relation to the National Socialist flag and the ardent National Socialist judge. And here, the red of Sophie contrasts with the red of the National Socialist state and can be linked to ideas of resistance, that she embodies a colour red or an idea that's markedly different from its appropriation by the National Socialist state. But in the case of Moore, it's more ambiguous, although no less significant. And then finally, an example of architecture. At one point in Lola Rent, we see her running across a bridge. Now, purely visually, this is a great scene, a great sequence. The arches of the bridge create a great visual impression and fit the very stylized aesthetic of the film. When we know which bridge this is, though, an additional level of meaning comes in. This is the Oberbaumbrücke in Berlin, and during the Cold War was a border crossing point. It's always worth remembering with Lola Rent, as a film made in 1998, Lola's run would have been impossible just a decade earlier. Within this highly stylized film, a film that isn't interested in Berlin's past, be that in terms of national socialism, be that in terms of the divided Berlin or the Cold War more broadly, it's fixed firmly in the present and has a dynamic approach in terms of its aesthetic and in terms of its soundtrack. It has a young character and a woman at that who confidently moves across Berlin. That said, it's also striking that at this point, not only does she cross Berlin, but she crosses a former boarding, uh, a border point. Of all the bridges that could have been chosen in Berlin, it seems more than a coincidence that this is the one that we're shown. And my point here isn't that we should be discussing the specificities of divided Berlin, but rather, as I said, to highlight the fact that of all the bridges that Lola could have run across, the Oberbaumbrücke is one with a particular significance. So towards the end, I'm coming to a close now and back to the diagram. Um, we've largely covered that third box of why. So um, when discussing the techniques, thinking about why this presentation is significant, being able to select relevant, interesting points is great, but we can only do this full justice if we then reflect on the implications. So again, what's the implications of filming this material in this way? And here there are multiple options or pathways. One might be that the way something is shot reinforces the theme being explored either in the scene or in the film, that they align. But sometimes there might be a tension and this tension might be deliberate. For example, there might be a mismatch between what we see and hear. Or thinking back to the screenshot from Goodbye Lenin with Alex, that we see a mismatch between the personal and the national. And this can be used as a way of drawing attention to new ways of approaching the material. And thirdly, and it's worth noting, there might be a mismatch and this might not be deliberate. In fact, it might be a weakness of the film. For example, we might have a film that seeks to challenge gender stereotypes by presenting a woman in a particular professional role, or she might have a particular narrative arc in the film. But the way that she is then portrayed and shot on screen might draw on reductive stereotypes. And as I reach the end, I just want to model a few examples of what I mean by these different pathways that we can use. And given I've mentioned it quite a bit this evening, uh, let's start with goodbye. Uh, sorry, let's start with Das Leben der Anderen. 
a core theme then in Das Leben der Anderen is the transformation of an officer in the Ministry for State Security from the role of perpetrator to potential victim. What do we see? Well, the film opens with an interrogation scene in which Wiesler is depicted as a loyal committed Stasi officer and occupies the role of interrogator and perpetrator. How is this presented? Well, we have an alignment here between Wiesler as the perpetrator and how he is depicted on screen and how the, uh, how the prisoner is shot and the use of color and mise-en-scene, so all the points we've discussed this evening. And these all work together to reinforce the role of victim and perpetrator. Does this then map out in terms of plot and narrative structure? Well, over the course of the film, Wiesler starts to doubt his actions and in the end sabotages the mission for which he's then punished. And his narrative arc is from a position of power to potential weakness and even victimization. And this, as we said, can be seen to be matched in the cinematography. Now, there is a follow on point here and one that isn't directly related to film analysis techniques, which is why I haven't covered it. But it is important with this film to reflect on what the implications of potentially presenting Wiesler as a victim are, especially when we've seen him as the role of the perpetrator in the beginning, because it's a particularly problematic narrative arc in this film. And to give one last example before I wrap up, uh, looking at Sophie Scholl, a film in which the core theme is resistance, but resistance in this film isn't about military resistance or political resistance, but rather is resistance carried out by students and driven by moral conviction. What do we see in the film? Well, the interrogation scenes are absolutely key, not least because we hear the reasons for Sophie's actions and the strength of her convictions are apparent. Does this relate to how we see this? Well, we've talked about the role of light in the film. Also, she's far from a typical figure of resistors from action films, not least again because of her gender. Does this map onto the narrative structure and plot of the film? Well, when Sophie is executed, the film concludes with a close-up of her face. The National Socialist State murders Sophie in order to end her resistance activities, but through this close-up shot and by creating emotional identification as well, her legacy continues to be celebrated today. And this can be understood as an act of defiance, resistance and bravery, which underpins the final moments of the scene. Just want to finish by putting some potential resources, and I'll copy these across to the chat afterwards as well. Um, in terms of German film terms, so the ideas that I've discussed today, if you want to find their German equivalents, there's two particularly good sites I've put here on screen. Also, there's a number of film guides related to the AQA list. If you haven't already seen them, there's the Bundeszentral für Politische Bildung have a number of film hefter. Um, they can be downloaded for free as PDFs, or you can order them as paper copies as well. The Goethe Institute as well does a number of uh, accompanying booklets. The URL on screen is, I believe, for the Greek office of the Goethe Institute, but if they don't have the film you're looking at there, it's always worth googling Goethe Institute and the film that you're interested in, and there might well be documentation. And then finally, that bottom link about film terminology is a website that I'm particularly fond of. It's in English, but it's a great way of checking out what a particular camera angle might be or continuing to develop the terminology of film analysis. Now, it contains far more than you'll ever need in your discussion of films, but it's a really great resource because you can click on a particular term and not only does it take you to a definition of that term, but there's an accompanying YouTube video from a film that shows it you in action. So you get a sense of what it looks like in a real example. And on that note, I will stop for this evening. 